Today I get to introduce, and I want a big Freedom Church welcome. A big Freedom Church welcome, okay? In fact, I'm just going to go ahead. I want, can we get on our feet and, and welcome Pastor Maria Coleman, the bishop, the bishop. What's up, Freedom Church? Week two of 2020, we still excited. You can go ahead and take your seat. Thank you for that, that love. I'm excited. It's week two. Do I have any fellow New Year's resolutioners in the audience? Anybody? Anyone? Shoot your hand up. Let me see. I'm not alone. Okay, we got a couple. Yes, I guess it's not as popular as maybe it used to be. Um, but yesterday I was driving home and I smelled something outside my car. My windows were open and it was a glorious smell. It was a smell that included some grilled onions, maybe some secret sauce. Uh, it was in and out Any in and out fans in the house? So one of my New Year's resolutions was that I wouldn't eat carbs. Um, so I smell in and out and I'm at this crossroads. Like, do I get in the drive through line or do I drive by? And uh, I started reasoning with myself. I don't know if you do this as well, but I was like, well, I can get a Flying Dutchman. Any Flying Dutchman fans in the house? A secret menu, if you really love In-N-Out, you know their secret menu. I will explain it to you. It is two patties with extra cheese in the middle, and I think they put extra salt in it, and it's glorious, and it tastes wonderful. So you can order a Flying Dutchman, go up to the window, say it. They'll know exactly what you're talking about. So I'm like, okay. I'm going to drive through. I'm going to get a Flying Dutchman. And um, I just sat for like 20 minutes in that drive through line. You know how long it is? And it was like 3 o'clock, and it was still that long. And I was like, well, I can't get out of here, so I'll just I'll, I'll go no carb, right? But the longer I sat and the more I just inhaled, I just wanted a bun or two. So... I'm here to tell you I broke my New Year's resolutions week two in. It's a confession, all right? I hope this is a safe place. Um, but I took it a little bit farther, and I got a side of fries, too. So um, there we go. New Year's resolutions are done this year. I think the key, um, what I would recommend from stage, is that you just have shorter bursts of resolutions, right? If you just take it on a little bit at a time, it's a little bit more attainable. Well, I want to jump right in to our passage today. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Daniel 3. We are in a study of the book of Daniel, and I am super excited about it. And I want to set up this moment in chapter 3 for you. So there is a king. He is very powerful. Babylon is the nation we're talking about, and they are one of the most wealthy and powerful nations that exist at this time. So King Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and he is ego-tripping, right? He wants everybody to know how powerful they are, how much he's in charge, and how nobody's better than him. So he gets this great idea to make a gargantuous golden statue that will declare to all that there will be no kingdoms after his, that all, he has all the power, and this will uh, solidify that. It will also centralize worship. So whatever he worships is what everyone else will worship. So he builds this 90 foot by 9 foot golden statue. So to give you some perspective, that is the distance. 90 feet is the distance between home base and first base on a baseball field. So this thing's huge. You can see it from everywhere. And he sends out this decree that he's going to play music. And every time the music is plays, ev played, everyone has to drop to the ground and worship this idol. So uh, it's done. It's up. We're getting ready for the first time that this decree is going to take place because the music sounds and everybody hits the deck and they fall to the ground and they worship his idol, except for three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we were introduced to them uh, last week in Daniel 1. And basically, these guys were Hebrew men. 
that were kidnapped into slavery. See, Babylon was that powerful that they could just go to other places, kidnap people, and make them slaves of their own country. So they're slaves, but they're kind of favored. They've gone up in the ranks and now are around the king. They, they have found favor with the king, and so they're here. So the king knows them, who they are. And I don't know if you've ever experienced haters in your life, but these three guys had some haters. So they were foreigners to this country. They were slaves that kind of became someone in, in that kingdom. They were advisors. They held rank. And everyone around them, I'm sure, absolutely hated them because they wanted to be them. And they should have been them in a lot of ways, but these guys had this special connection with the king. And so all the haters of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are uh, just waiting for them to make a mistake, to make a slip up, something that they could get in trouble with so that they could take their position. And so this moment comes and the music's played and everyone is on the ground except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they stand tall and they had made a decision because your loyalty determines your lifestyle. We learned that last week, that their loyalty was to God, and they weren't going to worship anyone but God. And so they stood tall, and the music stopped playing, and everyone got up and went about their business. But these other advisors, and it says astrologers, ran to the king, and they're like, King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, your, your guys over there, the Hebrew boys, um, don't believe in you. They don't want to listen to you, and they're not obeying the law that you've instilled. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar probably scratched his head, like, what are you talking about? I am the most powerful person in this kingdom. I am the law. What do you mean they're not listening? And so he summons them, summons, the <laughs> summons, summons, summons them to his court, and he brings the three before him, and he begins to ask them, like, what is going on? He said, well, if you don't bow to my idol, I will throw anybody that doesn't bow into my, to my idol into a furnace. Like, you will burn alive. And we're going to hop into verse 16, and this is their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know your majesty. I love how polite they continued to be to king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Come on, is this the most baller line in the scriptures other than the words of Jesus that we see? Can you imagine this moment where King Nebuchadnezzar, these three slaves that have kind of become citizens are before him? There's nobody more powerful than him. There's nobody whose life, you know, your life is in this man's hands. And they said, our God can save us. Our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your idols. Do you find yourself in this story all of a sudden? I don't know about you, but I can walk through life and daily see idols that are, are right in front of me that want me to bow to them and I have to tear them down or choose that my, my lifestyle is going to reflect where my loyalty lies. What also is interesting is that it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. It wasn't one guy that was the guy of the crew that was declaring this on their behalf. This was this joint, united front that they had. This is what it looks like when you've got the right people around you. Because I don't know if one of them could have taken that stance towards the most powerful man 
in their kingdom by himself. But this was their reply together. See, Ecclesiastes 4.12 says that one man can be torn down, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So I want to break down for us their response. It says, our God can save. Everybody say, can save. Our God is able. Oh, you could say that too. Um, Our God can save. And there's somebody here that needs to understand today. I believe you're here for this reason, that God can still save you. That you are not too far gone, that your sin is not so bad that he can't reach you. His ear isn't too far away to hear your cry and to hear your plea. His arm isn't too short to pick you up out of the mess that you're in. Our God can save. Can I get an amen in the house? He can save. He is able. It is within his power. And then our God will save. Those are two different statements, right? Knowing that God can save is what we call belief, right? I believe God can do it. But when you go and start declaring that God will do it, that is a deeper level of trust. That's a deeper level of faith. Because faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So we see that God and this crew of three guys has a trust. There's a relationship where they know that they can trust their God. But then we get into this over here where they say, even if he doesn't do it, even if faith, I want our church to be full of people that say, even if God doesn't rescue me this time, even if I don't get healed on my timeline. Even if God doesn't do what I have praying and been asking him to do for years, I'm still not bowing down to any other idols because he is God and I worship him alone. Even if, if we can have that even if faith, it changes everything. So if God can save... That's belief. God will save. That's trust. But even if he doesn't, can we call that testing? And isn't that the true test of faith? Even if he doesn't. So many times when we are in testing, we begin to ask ourselves similar questions, right? Like, why isn't God coming through? Why is this bad thing happening to me? Why do bad things happen to good people? Do you think this thought was in the minds of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I mean, they were doing the right thing and found themselves at this place in this test. But my prayer for us, Freedom Church, my desire is that we would mature to the level of not asking questions like, why is this happening to me, God? And we'd flip it to say, what happens when God's people happen to bad things? What happens when the church and the people of God rise up and infiltrate a godless nation? What would happen? That testing of faith We go, why me instead of it's me? All of a sudden, when things go wrong, we say, why is this happening where God could be sending us into a test that's going to result in a miracle for somebody else? What happens when God's people happen to bad things? There's one point for today's message. So if you're taking notes, get ready to write this down. If you want to see his voice in 2020, 
Something deeper than just hearing this sixth soul sense where God speaks to you and he illuminates things in your life. There is a depth to your relationship that is not tapped into yet. If you want to see his voice in 2020, then you're going to have to have the right people around you. Because here are these guys if it was one of them, do you think their confidence would have been as strong? Do you think that they needed a reminder about who God was in this tough time? They had the right people around them. So, Maria, who are the right people? I got it. One point. Get around the right people. How do I do that? The right people are Jesus-loving God-fearing friends that when you're going through a tough time will hit their knees in prayer for you. People that when your faith is running out, they're going to join your faith with their faith. And together you're going to know that God is for you and that you're more than a conqueror. The right people are the people of God. And how do you walk that out practically this week, Freedom Church? Sign up for a life group. You need the church around you. You need people of God. Oh, we need to do better than that. You need a life group. If you want 2020 to look different than 2019, you need to run towards people. I think it's so sad that so many of us live discouraged, live broken, and God's just saying, hey, I've got a group of people over here for you in the moment that you meet them. Your healing's over here. You don't have to live alone. The beauty of church is community. I say all the time, life group is the best part of church. Don't do life alone. I want to tell you a story about my life group. This story took place years ago. One thing that's unique about our church is that we're one church in three locations. Shout out to Highland Park and Sunland. Those are our extension sites that we love so much. But during the time of this story, we were one church in two locations. So this was years back, and things were a little bit different. And our staff was much smaller, and we were still newbies to this whole pastoring church thing. And... Uh, we decided for a season to move to Highland Park because so we wanted to be close to that location. We wanted to help strengthen that location. And so Justice and I moved and our kids moved to Highland Park and uh, we would commute, but we were part of an amazing life group that we love, loved dearly and deeply. And that was in West Hills. So we're living in Highland Park, come into life group in West Hills. And let me tell you, the traffic at 5 o'clock on a Thursday night would take us about an hour and 40 minutes to make it to Life Group. So, like, we are down for Life Group till, like, the wheels and the hubcaps fall off. We, we, we said eight weeks. We were doing eight weeks. We did years, right, of this back and forth. And uh, at that time, Highland Park had this sudden and drastic change in leadership, and so all of a sudden, people were hurting. This was a painful time uh, at Highland Park, and it was abrupt, and it was sudden. And if I could be super transparent, it was quite overwhelming um, for Justice and I. We had, I don't know, a very small staff at the time. So here we are trying to pastor and care for people in two locations, 35 miles apart. And... Uh, we came to our life group and we told them, we said, hey, sometimes it sucks having your pastors as uh, your life group leaders because right now we really need to dedicate our Thursday nights to Highland Park and training leaders and being with people there and walking them through uh, this next phase. And so uh, our life group, I think we cried, I think they cried because there really was this relationship with our life group that we, it was life-giving. We looked forward to every Thursday. Our kids loved being there. There was relationships that were so important. And so 
We cried, and they said, we got you, we love you, go do what you have to do, we're going to be here after. And uh, we were so grateful for their graciousness, and uh, we began to spend Thursdays in Highland Park. And if I could continue to be really honest with you, it was a discouraging time. Like, we were just stretched to a place that we didn't feel like anything was being effective, and we were tired, and I had two babies and a toddler on top of all this, so life was just overwhelming to begin with. And, and we were on this journey of trying to do two locations well. And I remember one Sunday night, we, would, we were in Chatsworth in the morning for multiple services, and we would drive out for a 6 p.m. service, and we're probably a few minutes away from 6 o'clock. And I sat on the front row in HLP and <sighs> took a big sigh. And I just remember discouragement really enveloping me. Like, is this going to work? You're tired. You're exhausted. You're stretched thin. People are hurting. And it was overwhelming. And just a few minutes few moments later, I got a tap on the shoulder. I just turned around, and it was this lady from my life group, like my West Hills life group. And she's like, hey. And I was like double take, and I stood up. I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, why are you here? She's like, for you guys. Just came to encourage you came to tell you we've been praying for you, we miss you. She brought her son with her, and can I tell you that there is not a person in this room that's not going to experience a moment of discouragement in their life where they just need someone to say, like, I got you, I've been praying for you, you're not doing this alone. And it was as if, like, I had more breath in my lungs, it felt like. Like, you came all the way out here just for me? Yeah, we're just here to, to be with you guys. And I was like, wow. And our conversation, before it even ended, all of a sudden, here came someone else from our life group. And another family from our life group. Our entire life group, every single member, drove out that night and surprised Justice and I to just say, like, we're with you. We know things are hard, but God, God, this doesn't take God by surprise. He still is. This is still his church. You are going to be okay. We're, it, it, was, it was as if life had been infused to my life in that moment, and the atmosphere changed, and their faith joined my faith, and all of a sudden, I felt like I could take on the world because I had the right people around me. No one is exempt from needing this in their life. Your friendships, church, will fuel your future. The people that you spend time with, the people that you surround yourself with will dictate what your future will look like. So start examining your life right now. Who do I have around me? Who's the person I call? What is the counsel I seek when I feel like life is crushing and closing in? So we go back to the text, and King Nebuchadnezzar, the advisors come and tell him what is going on. He's super upset. The scriptures say that he was filled with fury. And I began to read other translations. One said that he was purple in the face. Like he was so mad. No one had probably ever challenged his authority, but how many know when we're not under authority, we get a little squirrely? So this guy just thinks that there's nobody above him. There's no one that can touch him, and someone now has pushed back on his authority. So he says, you know what? Let's turn up 
that furnace seven times hotter. Let's go max temperature now. I, I want these guys to suffer. Not only will they be killed by being burned alive, but I want it to be the worst burn that they could experience. And then he gets his strongest soldiers and he says, I want you guys to tie them up because I want to make sure that those ropes don't come off. Verse 22 says, the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who Shadrach, Meshach, who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied fell into the fire. So did I read this correctly? That the soldiers that tied up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were killed. So are you meaning to tell me that the very thing that was supposed to kill them killed their enemies? Does this sound familiar to anyone in the room? The, the cross was the very thing that was supposed to crush Jesus. But all of a sudden, he crushed the devil with the very thing that was meant to crush him. Church, can I encourage you today that you feel like the flames are hot and life is crushing you, but that very thing may just crush your enemy. That very test may set somebody else free, and that is what we see in Scripture. Hold on, it gets better. Verse 25 says, he said, look, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Verse 24 said, the king Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? He said, they replied, certainly your majesty. And then he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of God. Do you catch what is going on here, church? They are thrown into a fire, and it is in the fire where the presence of God leaves heaven, comes to earth, and joins them in the fire. Would they have experienced that intimacy with God if they weren't in the fire? Probably not. Would they have that moment that they could look back on the rest of their life and say, I am more than a conqueror. God is going to meet me time and time and time again. But it came because they stood together. They had the right people around them to make such an audacious and outrageous stand. Church, would you stand to your feet today? I want you to catch this. Your test, your trial, your fire could be the very thing that set somebody else free. Do you realize that this was a godless nation? Babylon was so dark, but because of the stance they took together, an entire nation experienced God. I don't know what else gets you fired up or gets you excited, but the fact that I could be part of God's plan for somebody else's life trips me out day in and day out. We got to stop saying, what happens when bad things happen to me? And say, what happens to this world when the army of God rises up and comes and invades the dark places of the world. What happens when God's presence is unleashed in our community and our cities? Come on, let's praise him for being in the fire.